Amy Sizagele Marutile. It's an absolute pleasure to welcome you to the first installment of the Vitality Home Series. For this first talk, we'll be joined by panelists who are leaders in their respective fields, but the sum total of their contribution will cover science, aspects of behavior, and conversations with professional athletes who will share from their lived experiences. I will introduce my panelists a little later, so let's just get through some housekeeping. Firstly, please extend the conversation to social media by using the hashtag Vitality Home Series. We will hold a Q&A at the end of the discussion. Please post your questions in the Q&A box, not the chat box, and I'm sure you'll see it at the bottom of, of your screens. This is also being recorded, which means you'll have the benefit of listening to it one more or 10 more times with friends and family who were not able to join us today. On the panel today is an esteemed set of human beings, and I'm super delighted to be able to introduce them to you. First one to address us will be Professor John Patricius. He is a sports and exercise medicine physician at WITS. He will then be followed by a dialogue between myself, Bruce Fordyce, who's a nine times Comrades winner, and Wendy Lenongodwana, who has run the Comrades 12 times and secured seven silvers along the way. To round off our discussion will be Dr. Musima Mabunda, who is the head of Vitality Wellness at Discovery. We will get through this in an hour, so please post your questions as we go along. And now we're ready to get started. Over to you, Prof. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. I'm just going to share my screen and get going. Right, can we all see that? Good. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much to Vitality for arranging this and to the fellow panelists, uh, lovely to be with you. My brief today is really to talk a little bit about uh, why we should move more and why exercise matters during COVID-19. But as a start, I've, I've decided to rearrange the title and you'll see why. Uh, and that is to discuss move more why exercise matters before, during and after COVID-19. And we'll go through a few slides which, which demonstrate that. So if you're anything like me, the last few months, your brain has been a little bit like this and you feel there's corona and COVID all over the place. Uh, and hopefully in the next few minutes, an hour, we can help clear some of that clutter by, by putting a bit of science behind what's going on in the background. So I'm going to start off by putting the situation at the moment into some context. Now, at WITS, we did a webinar on COVID uh, fairly early in March, and we put this slide up, which showed where COVID was in relation to uh, deaths uh, caused by a number of diseases. Towards the end of April, we put up a similar slide and Corona or COVID-19 was looking something like this in terms of the pecking order. And last week it looked like this. So we can see that in this country and around the world, we really are in the face of a storm. And, and it's, it's no better time to discuss what we should be doing to try and prevent infections. So this is where South Africa phases itself uh, at the moment as we enter into the second week of July. We're now top of the table in terms of uh, biweekly growth rate uh, of coronavirus infections. So we really are at the bottom of a Mount Everest precipice, and we really need to take this very, very seriously in terms of trying to prevent it and protect ourselves. And what I'm going to discuss in the next few slides is how exercise is so important in doing that. I don't want to turn you, turn you into virologists tonight, but there are some key issues that we need to understand about this virus. And I'm going to refer to three things. One is its structure, how it's made up. The other is infectivity, how good it is at, at infecting people. And the third aspect is what we call morbidity or how sick it can potentially make you. So we're talking about this thing here and you've seen the stylized version countless times by now. 
just some terminology. It's called a coronavirus because it fits into this family of viruses that look like crowns. This particular virus is called the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and the disease it causes is called COVID-19. So that's some important terminology. In terms of this virus itself, some important structural issues which I want to address. The first is that it has what we call an RNA genome, which is the genetic material. And this is really what does all the damage. It's what replicates in our cells uh, multiple times, billions and billions of times. But the important thing about this, it requires a living human body to do its damage. Without it being in a living human body, it can't do its work. The second important structural feature is this spike called the glycoprotein A spike made of sugar and protein. It's not only a spike, but it's a sticky spike. So it sticks to our cell receptors in a very adherent way, and that increases its likelihood of infecting the cells. The third important aspect is what we call this envelope. Now the envelope in this particular virus is made up of lipid or fat. And the important thing about this is that this lipid or fatty layer is vulnerable to two important things. One is soap and the other is alcohol. And those two things remain our biggest assets in terms of defending ourselves against this virus. And that's very, very important to remember. So a little bit of virology to start. In terms of each of those things, in terms of the infectivity, this is a very interesting slide because it shows us on the x-axis uh, how infective a particular virus is, and then on the vertical axis, actually how severe it is in terms of causing deaths. So if you take some extreme examples like chickenpox, for instance, we all know that if you're exposed to chickenpox and you haven't been exposed before, you will contract chickenpox. It's a very, very infectious virus. But we also know that nobody dies from chickenpox. So it's not a very dangerous virus at all. Sorry, that's just slipped by. At the other end of the spectrum, if you look at Ebola, for instance, Ebola is much less infective than, uh, than chickenpox, but half the people that contract Ebola will die from it. So the result of that is obviously that it's a very severe disease, but also that it's not transmitted that often because the people generally die from it who suffer from it. Now, the interesting thing about COVID-19 is it sits somewhere in the middle. It's reasonably infective. So if you get exposed, you're likely to contract it, but it doesn't kill that many people. And so it's transmitted from one to another very easily because the people who have it are often not that sick or don't even know they have it sometimes. So it makes it very much more important to defend against, but also very difficult to defend against. So it's an infectious virus, but it's not too deadly. Interestingly, some other interesting aspect, kids don't uh, contract the virus as easily, and that's because they don't have as many of the receptors for the virus to stick to, and they have a slightly immature immune system. They don't transmit the virus as well either. But we do know there are vulnerable groups. We're going to refer to those now. And there's some other interesting aspects which make this disease something that we have to take seriously. We don't have an inbuilt immunity against it. It attacks a very vulnerable area of ours, and that's the respiratory system, the lungs in particular. There's this concept of a cytokine storm or, or how the actual virus uh, creates an inflammatory response within our own bodies, which causes its own damage. And it's come at a time when we're in a 21st century lifestyle of hustle and bustle, people who are very close to each other, and that's allowed it to spread very quickly. We also know there's no treatment, there's no vaccine, and it's come to South Africa where we usually have only 3,000 ICU beds available. So even a, a severe infectious rate of, of, of 4 to 5% in a population of 50 million is significant. In terms of the illness itself, we know that most of them are mild. Most of us are not going to have serious illnesses. It will be a cold or flu-like illness, a percentage are severe and may require hospitalization and probably up to four or five percent will require intensive care with probably about one to two percent dying. We know that the aged are most at risk from worldwide statistics, including in this country. And very importantly, we know that if you have certain medical conditions, 
you are much more likely to suffer severe COVID-19 disease than if you don't. And those are listed at the bottom here. Now, what's very interesting is the more interesting is the more of these you have, the more likely you are to be sick. So if you have three of these conditions, you are 48% uh, increased risk of dying. Now, also interesting is that those conditions listed at the bottom and on the side here are the conditions that have lower incidences in people who exercise regularly. So the point I want to make here is if you are a regular exerciser, you already have a head start in protecting yourself against COVID-19 because you are less likely to have heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, stroke, cancer, or dementia. And that's a very important take home message in that come the next crisis that we face, we should be protecting ourselves by exercising regularly. I want to talk a little bit about our immune response because this is all our body has to fight this condition. And again, we're going to talk a little bit about how our body does this in terms of what we call immunology. So there are really two stages to this. The first is what we call an innate immune system. It's, what, it's the cells we have waiting for any sort of virus or what we call a pathogen to come into our bodies. And don't worry about some of the terminology here, but look at the pictures and literally what these cells do, they lie in wait for anything that they recognize as foreign to the body and they effectively chew them up and get rid of them. And that's really the, the sort of lying in waiting immune system which we have. And one of the things that exercise does is it circulates these cells more. So it makes them more effective in terms of mopping up the viruses as they come into our body. When the body is exposed to the virus, it realizes often that it's a bit overwhelmed. So it sends out these messenger cells or chemicals known as cytokines or chemokines, which result in a whole lot of more cells coming to the rescue as it were. And that creates that inflammatory response, which in itself can be quite unpleasant to deal with. And then there's a second tier of the immune system called the adaptive immune system. Now it's adaptive because it adapts specifically to that virus or pathogen. And it takes a few days for this to kick in because it has to recognize the, the, the pathogen or the virus. And it has to specifically create proteins which kill the pathogen or antibodies which kill the pathogen. So that's the second tier of our immune response. And this also is improved in terms of efficacy by regular exercise. So we now have an immune system which is lying and waiting and we have an adaptive immune system which is specific which recognizes the body's own cells so it doesn't attack those, and which has a memory. So it it's leaves us with some immunity for some time to come so that we're protected against that pathogen uh, in future weeks and months. And as I've mentioned, exercise does a good job of upgrading this immune response. It flushes out bacteria and pathogens. It increases your antibody levels. It improves the circulation of the cells that fight infection. Exercise also causes a brief rise in temperature, which is less hospitable for the viruses, and it causes a lower release of stress hormones, which actually counter immunity uh, if they're in too high a level. So exercise is really a very good way of maintaining your immune system. We know, we've known for many years that exercise is very useful in many aspects. So if we look at its effect on life and on the body, it improves your cognitive function. We know that Kids who exercise do better at maths, for instance. We know that adults who exercise have lower levels of dementia. It improves your sociability and your social skills. It improves your emotional well-being. You have lower incidences of depression and anxiety. And we've known for years, as I mentioned, that those non-communicable diseases, the hypertension, the heart diseases, the diabetes, have much lower incidence in people that exercise. But one thing that we've always underestimated is the effect on immunity. And we need to start recognizing the number of ways in which regular exercise can impact positively on the immune system. So if we look at these, the exchange of those cells that fight infection, the cumulative effect, the more times you exercise, a 40 to 50% decrease in upper respiratory tract infections, a lower death rate of, from flu and, pneum and pneumonia, an enhanced response to vaccinations, 
and what we call delayed immunosenescence, which is the aging effect of the immune system. So as you get older, your immune system becomes less effective. If you exercise regularly, that doesn't happen as quickly. And then finally, very significantly, the response of the immune system is actually best in people who are obese, hypertensive, diabetic, and have cardiac disease. So if we look at all of those, importantly, those are the criteria which will determine a bad outcome from COVID-19. And that's exactly the, the cohort, the group that exercise targets best. And there's very good literature that summarizes this. Uh, and so there's very good science that, that supports this. Uh, and to the extent that when the government introduced a very strict lockdown, a group of us from WITS actually wrote an open letter to them based on science, summarizing the science to say, please, let's use exercise to actually fight this thing and not actually limit the amount that people are exercising. Because all we've got available to us is hygiene and exercise to fight this. And so we made a plea to open up public spaces in a controlled way, allow for more exercise time, reintroduce physically distant sports, encourage school children to exercise in a responsible way, and then gradually, as the situation allowed, reintroduce team sports. So, because we've been in a period of lockdown or restricted activity, we've had to learn to exercise at home and work. What are the guidelines in terms of exercise? And if you look up what are the guidelines for exercise, you'll often see three to five times a week exercise on most days and exercise for about 30 minutes at a time. Now, I want to really stress that I think that's a bare minimum recommendation. I think we should be exercising every day. We could often be exercising more than once a day, formally or informally, particularly in a lockdown situation. We need variety in our exercise in terms of cardiovascular load, strength, stretching, etc. And we need to vary the intensity, and we'll get to that in the question session, because there's a lot to be said about exercising intensity and whether that's good or bad. And I'm going to talk a little bit about, about that. And then very importantly, we need to start using technology better. We need to use technology for training. And I think we've all become accustomed to those sort of apps and the Zoom classes, etc. But importantly, what technology is going to allow us to do and allow uh, insurers to do in particular is track uh, our exercise patterns using artificial intelligence and digital applications. Because of the hard data we now have that shows how effective it is to exercise in fighting these conditions, we will be encouraged to exercise and rewarded for exercising as a result of technology becoming involved uh, in, in our exercise and monitoring of exercise. When it comes to the exercising and exercising safely, very important to, in this environment, exercise very safely. So that means on your own often, outside rather than inside, increase your physical distancing from one to two meters to four to six meters, clean your hands before and after, clean equipment before and after, and then address the issue of wearing masks. And there's unfortunately some confusing uh, messaging going out about masks. The, World Health Organization put this out saying you shouldn't wear masks when exercising. I think it's uh, misleading exercise uh, information. And I would rather we listened to this sort of information, which was put out by a South African group, actually, that gave much more uh, pragmatic advice in terms of wearing masks with exercise. And the take home message is wear a mask whenever you can. And if you can't wear a mask because of breathing discomfort, make sure you're exercising far away from other people and outdoors. Very important information about exercising. If you have contracted COVID-19, the guidelines are the following. You should be asymptomatic, have no symptomatic symptoms, uh, and wait a further 10 days after your last symptoms were experienced before you resume a graduated exercise program. In other words, start with low intensity and build up and if you're in any doubt, you should seek a doctor's clearance and she or he will put an emphasis on examination of your heart and lungs before clearing them. So to wrap things up and allow the more important speakers to go on after me, very important exercise is important in all people, in all situations and at all times. 
but particularly when we faced with medical crises and particularly those people that are most vulnerable to that medical crisis. Those are the people who will benefit most from exercise. We, need, we underestimate many of the effects of exercise, but we've always underestimated the effects on the immune system. And that's something that now makes us recognize that exercise not only protects us against non-communicable diseases, but communicable diseases as well. Where there's a virus or pathogen involved, if you're a regular exerciser, exercise is going to protect you. And so we need to be facilitating exercise and sport responsibly in whatever environment we are. And those are the take home messages that I'd like to leave you with today. Move more, exercise matters before, during and after COVID-19. So thanks very much for your attention. I look forward to the other speakers. And then most importantly, I look forward to engaging with you in the question and answer session. So thank you very much for, for listening. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, this was really sobering yet empowering and the questions have started flowing in. So there'll be a lot of discussion afterwards. If there are any key takeouts for me, the one is the idea that exercise matters all the time, not on the day that has a Y in it. It's like every Sunday, every day indeed. It improves our immune response and emotional well-being and sociability. If you exercise consistently, you are least likely to have those underlying conditions that increase your risk with COVID-19. The prof also said that soap and alcohol, I don't think he meant alcohol poos, I think he meant alcohol sanitizer, with masks as well as physical distancing. Those are still our best defenses under the current climate. I will now invite Bruce and Wandile to join the conversation. Hi, here we are. Well <laughs> yes. Hey, Wendy, are you there? Hi, Susan, and hi, everyone um, who's watching at home. Fantastic. So the question I have for both of you, perhaps, Bruce, you can start. How have you maintained your training during lockdown, particularly when we were at level five? Uh, not easily under level five. And I'm glad John said that because one doesn't want to be, you know, too delicate, but I thought the level five decision where we weren't allowed to exercise was appalling, where we couldn't go out of our houses. Um, but that's what we had to bear. And I think we all decided we would have to do the best we could. Um, and so my wife and I mapped out a 5k route around our garden, which meant we had to run 54 laps of our garden in order to get 5k's. So those were some of the slowest five kilometer times I've ever recorded. It was quite interesting because you've got to slow down to go around the tree, slow down again to go up the steps. And then the exciting part about it was every now and again, you change direction and you go the other way to make it interesting. Um, but amazingly, we did it. And it became part of our ritual of every day to go out there and do those 54 laps of the garden. And we in fact, wore a path around our garden from all the running. And so we named it the coronavirus ring. Um, and it was our little Formula One track. And there was a little straight where you could speed up slightly. And we took a photograph from above it to keep us a memory forever of how we managed to, to do it. Then obviously, as lockdown eased, it became easier to go out and run. And I now run uh, with a couple of mates. So I know I think we're allowed to be together in groups of four. And yes. we meet, we say we stay uh, properly distanced, and we run around the neighbourhood. So now it's no longer such a, a problem. I'm glad also that John said uh, not just five times a week. I probably exercise two to three times a day, but I'm excessive. Uh, I also now, because of lockdown, have started doing a little bit of gym because it compelled me to do something else. And so, as you can see from this fabulous upper body. I've been doing quite a lot of uh, gym work. You're not supposed to laugh. Quite <laughs> um, and, and it's become also part of my ritual. It's the morning I run and then the afternoon I do a bit of gym and also have a stationary bike, which by the way, I use during lockdown five. So that's actually interesting because you've, you've not only did you use what you had, but you've also created memories that you've captured for future conversations. That's, that's, that's really uplifting. We, Once, we're going, how did, yeah. Sorry, yes, I was just saying, we're going to look back on this time 
And I hope we'll look back, most of us, with pride about how we overcame this. Those photographs that, that we've taken true. will be part of the family album. That is true. Wendy, how did, how did you adjust during level five? So for me, Cesar, it's, it's, it's close to what Bruce um, did. Um, basically, running around the yard, uh, literally, and having a path within the yard. But also, as well, it gave me an opportunity to do other um, exercise that I don't normally do when I'm running. You know, like as runners, it's much easier for us to lace up, go to the road, you know, and you can easily kill an hour and more than that on the road and you come back. But we really do other functional exercises, you know, the lunges, the squats, and all of that. So um, level five gave me an opportunity to do that and try and mix, you know, so one day I'll probably run around the house, you know, the other day I'll do indoor training and basically use the space that I had. And also one other thing that I found it worked for me is, is that it was more of a coping mechanism for me. You know, it's, it's, it's one thing to stay at home, having a choice to go out, you know, but, but level five, you did not have a choice. You are bound to, to be in that confined space. And for me to keep saying, I, I had to do something. And fortunately, I mean, amongst other things as well, we had fair virtual runs. Um, we had that we did with, you know, um, vitality as well. So that helped as well, you know, and try and mix and match the type of exercise that, we, that you know, one would do um, as just running. You know, and, 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 and also, I mean, I've learned something that I was not aware of is that, you know, when you, when you run the same direction for a very long time, you even have an imbalance, you know, with, you know, when, when you're running because using one side. So like Bruce mentioned earlier on, you end up having to change direction as well to cope with that. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been an interesting time, but, but also it was more of, you know, train as much as you can, take time off, you know, from your regular day, whether be it watch TV and all of that, but over and above that, a way of having um, a mental health um, type of training, you know, just to keep calm, sane, and, you know, reducing the stress level as, as Prof said. But the, the, I think the fantastic part is that we're hearing you as professional athletes saying, you didn't stop moving, you made adjustments, you worked with what you had, and I love the, the part where Bruce refers to his improved upper body because he's now started switching <laughs> to gym. <laughs> you now started switching to gym. I don't have an upper body. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but now that we are now back to level three, at least there's a lot more activity and there's a lot more mobility. This question is for you, um, Bruce. What tips can you give someone to get back to running safely? Uh, well, um, Wow, running safely. Well, obviously, use your mask. Uh, I, I, as John pointed out, there are times you cannot. Um, so going up a very steep hill, what I do is I, I have to take my mask down because I just can't breathe if I'm going up a steep hill. But I, I keep away from people who may be approaching me. The other thing is um, actually do run with other people because it was this time two years ago that I was, I was mugged. Um, I was mugged while out running and uh, held up at gunpoint. And funnily enough, my shoes were stolen, which were, had done 800 Ks, both of the, the pair that I had. So they weren't really worth much. And they also smelt of gorgonzola cheese, but they were stolen from me and a very cheap watch. Um, and so I think if I'd had company, I might've had, better, um, uh, had a better chance of not being mugged. Uh, and yeah, just, uh, don't try and do too much too soon. I'm not sure exactly what you mean by safety, but to avoid getting injured, you know, as we now back into uh, lockdown three, please don't, yeah. Uh, yeah, don't overdo it. Come back gradually and gradually increase your, your mileage. Fantastic. Thank you. So here's my last question to you both. Wendy, how has lockdown affected you mentally as an athlete? Um, I think... For one thing, for starters, um, as as runners, we always look forward to races. We always have a goal, you know. And and for a lot of us, you know, who do run and who do comrades, 
we, you know, we're looking forward to comrades. So one thing, there was a delay in the announcement of comrades being um, canceled. And therefore, for, for some time, even during le le level five, you know, we're still hoping that it is gonna be, comrades is gonna happen, you know, and, and you know, within few few months before comrades, um, and then we're told that it was canceled. So there was a bit of a, there was a bit of a, I, I wanna say depression, but there was a bit of, um, a, you know, a situation whereby, you know, one is saying, you know, so what now, what do I look forward to? You know, um, and also, you know, I think we all know that all the major races have been canceled. So we didn't have much things to look forward to as runners, but also, like I said earlier on, during level, level five, um, during that lockdown period, you know, I think that is when one was able to, to use what I was doing during that time to say, you know what, whether there's a race or not, I need to keep fit, I need to keep moving. It's more than just going for a run, you know, for, I've been preparing for a race. It was more than just that. And, that, and that's basically what, what I've learned during the, the, the lockdown is that this is more than just a, a um, running um, and preparing for races. It's, it's basically a coping mechanism. It's, a, it's, it's basically a way of staying fit, healthy. And, and as Prof uh, has mentioned, you know, it's one of the things that makes us um, uh, people to be active and, and boost their you know, immune system and, and healthy. You know, it, so, so that's basically what's, what keeps me motivated right now. Stay fit, stay healthy, and do as much as I can in the, in the limited time that I have. Fantastic. I, I cannot contradict any of the statements you guys have offered us. And because what's really important is the message of just stay active, keep moving, and whatever your condition, continue to make adjustments, but please don't stop exercise. I'm now super excited to welcome Dr. Mabunda because she will then give us the behavioral components that surround exercise. And, and also I'm sure from her talk, we'll be able still to take away tips that we can implement when we get home so that we too continue to stay active. Good evening. And thank you, Sizakele, for the introduction. I'm trying to move to the next slide. Please pardon us as we try to fix the technical glitch to move on to the next slide. We'll be with you shortly in a moment. There we are. As Prof. Patricius has mentioned, we know how important physical activity is for our health and well being. You can see from this data set that the more active you are, the less your risk of premature death. Yet we're not moving as much as we should. The COVID 19 pandemic has magnified the importance of healthy lifestyles. In discovery, we did an interesting analysis that actually showed how physical activity can offset your risk of severe COVID-19 disease. What is even more profound to notice is if you look at the bottom graph, you can see that whether you're healthy, whether you have comorbidities, or whether you're older, engaging in healthy lifestyle behaviors, specifically physical activity, offsets that risk. Lockdown has had an effect on physical activity. I think Wandi and Bruce picked up on it nicely to just give us a glimpse into the effect that lockdown had on physical activity levels. Though it continued to remain top of mind as people were investing in equipment to ensure they can remain active in the comfort of their own homes, activity levels declined. We have seen that since the announcement of lockdown level five, where really movement was restricted, there was a 55% decline in activity level as compared to earlier March before lockdown was announced. The good news though is as the measures were eased, people started picking up physical activities and level increased. 
What we are seeing now, though, is mainly a seasonal effect, which compares to what we see normally in winter, where people prefer to stay at home because it's warm and cozy. But the interesting effect um, with this data set is that we've seen that for those members who use heart rate devices to be physically active, they've continued to stay 52% more resilient than those without heart rate devices. This underscores our proposition where we try to get as many of our members to use devices as possible because we see the benefit. Discovery's shared value model, which applies behavioral science to keep people healthy, can make a profound contribution to our society as it builds resilience against communicable and non-communicable diseases, as Prof alluded to earlier. So what can we borrow from some of these behavioral science principles to keep ourselves motivated to exercise? I think Bruce touched on this a bit. Start small, small manageable goals and build from there. It is easier to get started that way. And you also avoid injuries. Make it social. In the current environment, virtually so, because we need to stay safe as we continue being active. There are various platforms that you can leverage to keep you social and connect with community of people who stay active. It is very useful to make an upfront commitment about the type of physical activity you plan to do, the time that you plan to do it in, and the day that you plan to do it. This protects you from the indecision of the moment, and it can actually minimize your ability to procrastinate. Many of us are familiar with using New Year's resolutions, birthdays, and other personal milestones to motivate us to start new lifestyle behaviors such as physical activity. Since the lockdown, I prefer to actually see each new day as a fresh start and use that to motivate me to get back on my exercise routine. It is very powerful to see how far you've progressed when you track physical activity. Many of these modern devices and some of the apps allow people to track physical activity. In doing so, you easily see the progress you've made and it's easier to stick to that habit when you can see that you're making progress. And lastly, in our program, we have seen the benefits of positive reinforcement to encourage people to build sustainable behaviors. We reward our members for hitting their weekly goals. And that has helped numerous members to make healthy living a lifestyle. Remember, this is not a sprint, but a marathon. So take it easy. Remember to stay home, stay healthy, and if you are a Vitality member, stay rewarded. Thank you. Thank you so, so very much, uh, Dr. Mabunda. I think part of what you are encouraging us to do is to truly find ways to keep ourselves motivated. There's a feel good factor you get when you know that you're making progress. I love the idea of making it social because I can tell you, I have enough friends who will track me and keep me accountable uh, to commitments you make up front. The idea of every day presenting an opportunity to be a fresh start is one that we all can relate to. Because if you don't get to hit your milestone today, don't give up. Tomorrow is another day to behave differently. What's also fantastic is that we do live in an environment where we, we have tracking devices that can keep us motivated. Uh, but also it means that you will continue to be rewarded as you heard from Dr. Mabunda for keeping up your activity. I mean, I was chuckling when you were showing the graph about the spend on exercise equipment, because I think I was one of those who was rushing in to try and, die and buy dumbbells, which I haven't used because I've switched to something else, but it's encouraging. And I'm hoping that now we'll see that the turn with people returning to physical activity. We will now be receiving some of the questions that you've been posting during the conversation. And thank you ever so much for just staying engaged. Um, the first question goes to Professor John. Um, we have an individual who's asked the following question. She says, 
is hit training okay during these times because she's found a sports field uh, 1.5 kilometers away from her home and she just wants to know whether that's not too stressful a form of exercise. Thank you. So just to put it into perspective, HIIT training or high intensity, high intensity interval training really refers to pushing your heart rate up to high levels regularly and then dropping it uh, from time to time and, and intervals uh, of high and lower intensity exercise for a period of time. And that's one of the forms of exercise that's increasingly been promoted. And for good reason, it's been shown to be really beneficial in prolonging the metabolic effect of exercise. So it's a very effective form of exercise rather than sort of a slow rhythmical type of exercise. And in fact, it's been shown to do things like burn fat more efficiently, which we didn't realize before. So yes, it's very effective. Who is it effective for? Well, I think like any exercise, it takes time to adapt to it. So I would encourage people to move into that level of intensity of exercise gradually over a period of perhaps four to six weeks. Don't take on a session immediately. The second thing is that you need recovery. So don't try and do those sessions repeatedly in the same day and even repeatedly in the same week. You need to actually have some days which are lower intensity, others that are higher intensity. So those are the two, two take home messages is ease into it and make sure you build in sufficient recovery and then you will derive the full benefits from HIIT training. Fantastic, thank you so much, Prof. The next question is for Dr. Mabunda. And the question is, what happens to our vitality status in 2020 as many of these events that were pre-planned have been canceled and the fear of contracting COVID is keeping us away? Thank you, Sizakele. We have continued to innovate our program to ensure that members have options to engage and remain active. What things that we did on the physical activity front is create virtual exercise options. And on the assessment side, we created an option for members to have a virtual check-in. So we continue to revise our program and make it meaningful and will not penalize members for things outside of their control. Thank you so much. The next question I have is for Wendy. And that question is, what can, no, actually let's ask a, a much more complex one. It says, heavy training does weaken immunity. How can a runner avoid overtraining? Over to you, Wendy. Um, so, so there's a couple of things that one would pick up as a sign of overtraining. And one of those is fatigue. Um, and also, and, and it means that one has been putting a lot of, um, lot of training. So, so you need to reduce your training, but also you need to alternate your, your training as well. Have proper recovery, recovery time, rest, have active rest, you know? So instead of being on the road for a very long time, you know, do something else. Um, as I mentioned, make sure that you have an active rest and, and reduce your, your, your training. I mean, right about now, honestly, I mean, if you to think about it, there isn't a lot to, to train for, you know, other than to stay healthy, um, active and, and being fit. You know, there isn't much races that are out there. Um, so, so really we should, as, as you know, a doc said and prof said, you know, we must build up gradually, you know, and have, and, and have those um, small goals that one needs to achieve. Fantastic, thank you so much. Bruce, there's one for you. And the question is, what can we do to stay mentally sharp? Uh, it's hard at the moment, you know, to stay mentally sharp because as Wandela said, there's, there are no goals. But I love this little quote that I picked up somewhere. And that, this is from Admiral William McRaven, who at a graduation ceremony, he was asked to speak. And he said, make your bed every morning. And so I'm going to replace that by saying, go for your run every day or five or six times a week. Because when you've done that, you feel good about yourself and you feel I've done something positive already today in a negative situation. And what happens, I found, I go for my run. So I make my bed, I, you know, I, literally, I've, not literally, but I, I'm really bad at making my bed. But I, I go for my run 
And I tend after that to say mo mentally sharp and motivated the whole day through because having done, achieved one thing, I immediately want to do another thing. And so I'm just giving a quick advert for myself. During lockdown, one of the positives for myself is that I've written a book called Comrades Marathon Novices, which I will bring out in a couple of months time. I only did that because of lockdown, because I now suddenly had the time, but also because every morning I made my bed by going for a run, which got me back home saying, now go and work because you're on a high. And that's, I, I think, is one of the ways, just keep that, that we don't have any races as one dealer said, but keep yourself motivated and sharp by going for that run or that exercise every day. Fantastic, thank you so much. Dr. Mabunda, we have another one for you. And that question is, what will happen to Vitality Gym benefit during this period and the requirement to meet the 36 visits in 12 months? Thank you, Sizakele. At the present moment, since gyms are not open, we have not required our members to meet their minimum visits. So members are not penalized for not going to gym. As gyms come on board, we will continue to review our program and revise and let our members know how the program will evolve. Um, the next question is for Prof. Uh, and this question is, can you still train if you are asymptomatic and have tested positive for COVID-19? I guess before you answer, perhaps explain for those of us who don't understand what asymptomatic means. So asymptomatic means you're not feeling sick in any way. You don't have any symptoms, no headache, no runny nose or sore throat, you're feeling okay. But for some reason, you've been exposed, perhaps you, you've worked with someone who has COVID, so you thought it necessary to be tested and you've found that you're positive. Now, if you're positive, it means you in all likelihood have the virus in your system. And when you have a virus in your system, there are risks involved. And when you're exercising, that virus can circulate more quickly through your system. And so even if you're feeling okay, it's important to be cautious. And we feel you need a minimum of 10 days of being asymptomatic before you ease back into an exercise program. And if you're in any doubt, I'd rather you consulted a doctor because there can be some other tests done to show whether there is active infection in your system and you can be guided accordingly. So the answer is no, don't exercise until you've waited at least 10 days and or sought medical advice. Fantastic. Thanks, Prof. We have another one for you. And the question is, what form of exercise would you recommend for somebody who's got type 1 diabetes? So the answer is really, you've got to do what any, any exercise that you find enjoyable. Exercise needs to be enjoyable. It shouldn't be a burden. So you've got to find what works for you. And there's so much variety now. But I'd encourage you to do exercise that allows some movement. So you need to be moving, whether it's walking, whether it's cycling. Uh, I think there should be a strength component to it. So you need to have some degree of, of strength work. And it's got to be appropriate for you. So if your issue is that you are... Uh, hugely overweight, then, you know, perhaps running isn't the ideal thing for you. And also important to bring your medical team into that decision. So if your uh, sugar is very well controlled and stable, you could probably do a lot more. Uh, if it's not that good, then you probably got to do a lower intensity exercise. Uh, and the thing with a type 1 diabetic is that there are some risks involved in terms of sugar control. So you need to consult your doctor and perhaps even have supervised exercise sessions in the beginning until you find what works for you and what maintains your sugar at safe levels. Fantastic. Thank you so, so much, Prof. Um, Dr. Mabunda, I have another question for you. And this one has to do with exercise for seniors. Can you talk to us about that, please? Thank you, Caesar. I think most of the panelists alluded to the importance of physical activity. And in my slide, I had a graph that shows the importance of physical activities even as you get older. So it is important for seniors to stay active, but obviously being mindful of your ability and your fitness levels. So definitely it is encouraged that even though you are older, you should still exercise because we've seen that it can offset the risk of severe COVID-19 disease. 
so what I'm hearing you say is there's no day off for seniors. <laughs> we all have to continue to find ways to, to, remain, to remain active. I have another question for Wendy, and that question has a lot to do with motivation levels. If races are being canceled, how do you keep yourself motivated? Um, yeah, look, I think, I think um, one of the ways that I keep motivated is um, basically have short goals. Um, I mean, for example, right now, mentally, I know that round about this time, um, a lot of runners would have been from, from comrades, they would have rested and stuff. And, and one of the races that, that they would have been looking forward to is all the ads, which is one of their vitality series. So sometimes in my mind, I'll prepare and say, you know what, virtually, you know, there's a race that could be coming up, but I won't be doing it. However, if it were, if, if it were to be, then maybe I need to prepare for it. So, so have, have small goals. You know what? And also one of the things is, um, I mean, for me, if I don't go for a run, I don't have that full feel good thing. You know, I don't have that. If I don't exercise, I don't have that feel good thing. But at the same time, like I mentioned earlier on, um, you need to make sure that you, stand, you stay constantly working out, um, but then at the same time, try and have some rest in between. Because that motivation as well could be you've been over-exercising, you know? So you need to gauge yourself, have small goals. And, and also it's always good, you know, to have friends that can um, hold you accountable. You know, I've got friends, you know, that we normally share, you know, this is what I've done during the day, uh, what I'm planning to do during the week. So, so they, they, they keep me accountable as well. So have that small community that you can work out with um, and have those um, small goals. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much for your rich questions, because the more we ask them, they also deepen our understanding. I now have another question for Dr. Mabunda. This one is about park runs. Could they count towards the weekly 300 vitality points, which were allocated pre-lockdown? Somebody wants to know. Um, if I understand the question, I think um, the member is trying to understand whether Park Run counts for 300 points. Um, you will know that pre-lockdown, we have a partnership with Park Run um, and Bruce is our ambassador, where if you go for Park Run, you, will, you do get your 300 points. But as a result of the lockdown regulation, mass events have been cancelled and there hasn't been a Park Run. Therefore, until we resume back to a state where events are allowed, we will then reintroduce the points that we allocated for our events. Thank you so much. I have another question for Bruce. Bruce, the question is the Comrades Legends virtual race. Um, are we going to see these kind of races in the future? What do you think? Well, I certainly hope so, because it was an unprecedented success. And I don't think even comrades themselves had, had any idea that 43,000 people would participate. And what it did do is it, it made the comrades family bigger and broader and friendlier and more welcoming and not so exclusive, so to speak, because you, as we all know, you could get a medal and a t-shirt and everything for running five kilometers. And I think it will become a permanent feature of the comrades marathon. I don't think on the same day as race day, obviously that would clash but I'm sure they're going to do it again just to, it, it just generated the most incredible interest. And on that day when I ran, there were people everywhere, cars went past and hooted. People put seconding tables outside their houses for anybody who was running with the comrades number on. So I think it was brilliant. And of course, as we know, I mean, going, if you, you're looking at a future goal, I believe the Soweto Marathon is gonna be a virtual race. So why don't people start training for that? Um, and the virtual race concept is definitely going to be here in the future. Fantastic. Thank you ever so much. Thank you to you at home who's been watching because the quality of your questions have truly, truly kept us on our toes. And I hope you are um, uplifted by firstly the input from the various members of the panel, but also uplifted by the quality of their responses. Because here's what I have heard. I've heard that exercise matters in and out of COVID. 
I've heard that it, it has more benefits, more than just the physical benefits, it's also got the emotional benefits. We've had conversation about understanding how the virus works and how it enters our system and what we have within our means to continue to protect ourselves. I'm mindful of time because we promised you you'd be out of here in an hour and we've got five more minutes. So I'm going to exercise some liberties by asking each member of the panel to just give us one word. If there's one word you want us to take away, what would that word be? I will start with Prof, followed by Bruce, followed by Wandile, followed by Dr. Mavunda, and then we will check out. So I'm going to use the word consistency. You need to exercise consistently to gain the benefits, and it needs to be as much a part of your lifestyle as brushing your teeth is. Consistent exercise. Fantastic. Thank you, Prof. Bruce? I'm going to use the Afrikaans expression, phosphate. You cannot successfully translate phosphate, but I think we have shown incredible phosphate as a nation and as a group of people who are interested in exercise, we've shown incredible phosphate and in being able to endure this time. So yeah, phosphate, if you had to translate it into English, resilience. I, I've been immensely proud of South Africans, the way they've, they've shown this that resilience and phosphate. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Bruce Wandile. Um, I think for me, my last choice will check in with your friends, families, um, and see how they're doing. Keep each other accountable and motivated. Um, I mean, during this lockdown uh, period, you know, while others are at home, others are isolated, they still need to be looked after, you know. So it's always good to, you know, to hear a word saying, say, hi, how are you doing? How's been your day? And, um, and yeah, those are my last words. Stay safe. Fantastic. Thank, thank you. Dr. I want to leave you with safety. Stay safe. If you're at home, stay safe. If you're venturing outdoors, stay safe. Put on your mask, wash your hands regularly, sanitize your hands and physically distance. Fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. Um, I hope that you have enjoyed it. Uh, before I say good night and goodbye, I too will remind you to stay safe, stay home, and stay rewarded. Until next time, continue to look after yourselves and move, move, and move.